Hello, I'm Nick Warburton, Acting Editor of Irish Magazine, and welcome to our round table discussion on Working at Height. Um, I'm delighted to be joined today by four industry experts who will talk at Work at Height issues, um, including the all-party parliamentary group's report Staying Alive, um, but also much more broader issues around um, Work at Height issues um, across different sectors. Uh, I'd just like each individual person to introduce themselves before we start, um, beginning with Peter. Hello, uh, Peter Bennett, Managing Director of PASMA. PASMA is the lead industry body for mobile access towers. Uh, Executive Director of the Ladder Association, uh, Chair of the Access Industry Forum and Chair of the Board of Trustees of the No Falls Foundation. I'm James Sainsbury and I'm the Full Protection uh, Sector Specialist for M uh, MSA Safety. Uh, MSA Safety, our global uh, full protection product manufacturer. I'm Eleanor Hill. I'm Managing Director of the Delta Group and also a Council Member for Atlas, the Association of Technical Lightning and Access Specialists. Good morning. My name's Alan Harris. I'm the Director of Prefix Access Scaffolding Contractors in Fareham and Hampshire. I'm also the Chair of the National Access and Scaffolding Confederation's Health and Safety Committee, uh, producing guidance for the access industry in the United Kingdom. Very generally, what do you see as being sort of the main failings that are out there across different sectors? Um, Peter, would you like to start? Um, I think this is going to be a recurring theme in the mm -hmm. discussions, um, because the fact of the matter is we actually really don't know. Um, we can conjecture and we can have a best and perhaps educated guess at, at what it may be. Um, and there is no doubt that there are things like uh, pressures of resources, pressures of time. Um, but I, I, you know, my gut feeling is that the main cause of fatalities and falls from height is the very real situation where people work at height on a regular basis and they, they become inured to the, to the risk. Uh, they become uh, you know, so used to working at height that they, they don't see that, that there is a problem. Uh, and I suppose that is evidenced in you know, some of the anecdote, anecdotal evidence that we hear from, from some survivors of falls from height, who pretty much say they thought it would never happen to them. I think whatever, how, whatever the reason is for a particular fall at height, it all comes down to people, doesn't it? It's the person that's fallen. So we're talking about things like behavioural safety, we're talking about things like culture, the culture of the organisation, how the individual thinks about going to work, setting him or herself to work in the workplace, that continual risk assessment, that continued ha continual hazard perception, I think it's all of those human influences and like Peter says I think this will probably be a recurring theme as well. Yeah we'll definitely come back to a lot of these, these points as we go through the discussion. Alan? Well I have to agree with both of those answers. The, the, the thing that we find as scaffolding industry is that also the complacency and lack of training is something that you know, is, is makes a, a difference. Um, the NESC the, the, the makes a point of training all its personnel, whether they're labourers, yard workers, scaffolders, supervisors and management. So this helps reduce the risk involved. Education, education, education. Um, we live in an industry, construction industry is so great and sparse and um, a variety of trades and bodies and uh, you know we spend a lot of time trying to educate and um, you're only as good as uh, you know, implementing that actually on in, on the ground and, uh, and and from you know from the top top right down to the down to the, actually the, the nitty-gritty of it it's about understanding what the risk is and yeah the perception of working at height is on the top of Big Ben you know in perceived risk but uh, it could be off a stepladder it could be um, it could be it could be anything Anywhere that you can fall and Absolutely. cause yourself personal injury, it is a work. You are working at height then, yes. aren't you? It's, it's quite interesting that we should say that as well because um, uh, when Professor Ragby Lofstein was undertaking the view of the work at height regulations, there was quite a there was quite a strong lobby to reintroduce the so-called two metre rule. Um, and I know that from our point of view, in access in this forum, we were united in saying we should not reintroduce it. It wasn't there in the first place as it happens, right? But this concept that low level heights, you know, you're, you're somehow, you know, you've got some sort of magical protection, uh, you know, when you're at 1.99 metres 
it, it, it's a fallacy and in actual fact we've we got our colleagues at HSE to look up some of the stats and whilst there are not so many fatalities from low heights there are loads of injuries loads of life-changing injuries but well, it comes back to your heights. point you made yeah. at the beginning about complacency isn't it i think as soon as you've got a two meter rule Correct. in there very good point as yeah. soon as you're below two meters complacency slips in i think yeah. as, as as soon as you know that you can fall and injure yourself you're working at height we we, uh, we manufacture a lot of rooftop um, access systems and and to touch on a two meter rule um, also horizontally so in uh, the HSE guidance a few years ago, there was a two meter mm -hmm. boundary, if you like, from a, from a, a known risk. Um, you know, put a bit of sticky tape down and don't cross that barrier. Um, the, the problem is that is, you know, that is still perceived as a, as a recognized uh, uh, method, if you like, and, and actually it's not, a, it's not something that's gonna last. Um, you've also got to address the, the rescue side of things as well. So you, know, you can stop someone from falling and if you put the right, the right products in place, the right, uh, the right training, the right, the, the right, the right products. But um, you've also got to rescue someone if they if they misuse that or use the wrong type of PPE. Um, but yeah, it's, it, it comes back to that education again. Yep. Go on. Sorry. I think with, with training, tra training is obviously essential. At Atlas, we say that all our members have to train, and we have a, a minimum percentage of, of working hours that that has to be devoted to training. But it's also the experience, it's implementing that training, implementing that learning, implementing that knowledge. And I think that comes back to the culture bit of it. So you can give people yeah. the tools, they can be in their head, but then they have to actually apply them. They have to know why they're applying them and they have to believe the reasons why they're applying them. That's good. But that could also mean that supervision and management control of your operatives you know, need to be on top of you know, the, the working practices and the safe systems of work that, are, that you produce as a manager should be implemented on site and that only comes through supervision. Mm. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's yeah. A point. So, uh, you know, it's a point that's been used a, a couple of times by a few people in respect of training mm -hmm. and there is no doubt about it that certainly from our perspective in Access Industry Forum it's a very, impo it's a very important feature of all of the organisations who, who are part of the Access Industry Forum. But uh, some of them, or certainly one of them in particular, struggles to get that message across. And what I mean by that is uh, when you look at scaffolding, when you look at MOOPs, when you look at towers, when you look at suspended cradles, it's pretty obvious to people well, that kind of stuff is kind of dangerous. You know, we really should know what we're doing. Where we have a real difficulty is in the, let's say, the less sophisticated work equipment, ladders and step ladders. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, I also I'm involved in the Ladder Association and we have a real difficulty in persuading people that you should be trained and you should be competent to use a ladder as much as, if not even more so, than some of the other more sophisticated work equipment. Um, and I've explained it to others before from the point of view of if you take the hierarchy and if you look at it from the point of view of you should firstly avoid, then you should try and prevent, then you should try and protect from distance and consequences. And if you have no other options, if there is no other way to mitigate the risk, the only option left to you is training and supervision. Now, that, as I say, has been a big issue for the Ladder Association, who, who although I must say um, things are improving, uh, I, I think if my memory serves me correctly, trained about 8,000 delegates last year. Um, but if you compare that to, for instance, on the um, tower side, we train about 75,000 delegates through PASMA scheme. On MUPS, there was, it was in excess of 100,000 delegates trained. Uh, and if you look at it from the point of view of the relative numbers of the types of equipment out there, 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 is, there are some real issues that need to be addressed. Steeple jacks have used ladders for, it's, for it's donkeys. A it, it, it is a perception. It's a yes. very real perception. Um, I would say that, that our steeplejack operatives are very good at using their ladders. That's, that's their bread and butter access methodology. You're not going to get a mute to go 170 no. metres high. They have to use ladders. And you watch some of our operatives ladder a, a tall structure, it be a chimney, a cooling tower or whatever. And it is, it is very regimented. It, they're very diligent in what they do. There's very, um, very clear job steps to get that done. It, but it is a perception thing, it, and I think that's come from HSE. If um, being fair to our colleagues at HSE, they were really quite clear in uh, trying to counter that perception, where they said, we have not said that, we're not saying ladders are banned. And in actual fact, the wording which is now used in the simplified guidance 
it states it slightly differently, and it says whilst some, something along the lines of whilst it may not be your first choice, sometimes lathers are, the, are, are a suitable uh, solution for working. And as long as you've gone down your hierarchy, yeah, exactly. and, and you, could, you can justify what duration, you've done. Yes. Yeah. But also, I imagine that within sort of the what we classify, I suppose, as the work at height sort of industries, people who use ladders are going to vary very, very much, aren't they? So the kind of industry that you represent is going to be very different to some, other, some of the other ladders. And even if we are laddering a very tall structure, we would then get to the top and we would, we would rig another access solution. We wouldn't be accessing from the ladders all the time. We'd, we'd put up a, a, a cradle or a gondola or, or some ki other kind of powered work system so that they could get us to to our, our work platform. Well, the access and egress of any situation, you know, working zone is normally the most risky. Um, you, know, you look at a rooftop, the transition from a ladder to a rooftop is the most risky because you're at that, you're at that edge. But that goes back to the culture thing, doesn't it? Yes, that the the operative in question is, is thinking about getting to work. It's not thinking about how he's going to get to no, work. No, it's thinking, it? thinking, I, I, I want to get to my what, work location oh, and I, I want to start yeah. work. The all-party parliamentary group um, report, Staying Alive, which we have on the table, um, makes four recommendations to try and improve work at height um, practices. Um, uh, Peter, I know that you've been involved in the um, APPG. Um, one of them's around a reporting system um, through RIDOR to record um, the scale of a fall as well as uh, work method. What's so significant about this? Well, it goes back to the point that I'd made at the very outset that when you ask me a question, why is this happening? What, is, what are the causes for that? The simple fact of the matter is, I don't know. And the reason we don't know is because the uh, data which is uh, gathered in respect of reporting injuries and uh, dangerous occurrences and fatalities is all in free form. So it's done in free text. And that makes it very, very difficult to analyze it, to basically look at it, to see what trends are. And, and whilst, you know, we, you know, we have put forward freedom of information requests before, and we're told that our colleagues at HSE can do data mining, um, my contention is, and always has been, why don't we just ask the right questions in the first place, and then you don't need to do the data mining. I, I don't think it's going to be difficult at all. We have put forward to the HSE before, in fact, at the last review of RIDOR, we, we had put forward a proposal to ask an additional, I think it was maybe only eight or nine questions that would stream it into, okay, so the first thing is, was the work at height equipment, first of all, was the work at height equipment you were using designed for the purpose? Or were you standing on a chair? Or were you standing on a, on a, on a, a wardrobe or a, co a cupboard? If we can, first of all, say, yeah, it definitely was equipment that was designed for the purpose. Okay, so what kind was it? Was it a tower? Was it a scaffold? Was it a mute? Was it a, a ladder? That again streams it in the direction of the different organisations. And all of this, we, you know, can be asked really quite simply, as soon as we know that it is a fall from height, stream it in that direction, ask these additional questions from a drop down menu, and it would not put any additional burden on industry, which is, which is, I think, is the big, or what is given to us as the big concern that's going to be an additional burden on industry. No. The NASC publishes a report every year, it's the safety report. It's um, based on data given by the members, which is 17,000 scaffolding operatives. And that has, I think, 12 questions on board. It basically, starts whether it was in the yard, was it on level ground, was it working at height, what was the height, and circumstances that, you know, that caused the, the incident. And all that is in, is readily available from our industry as the NASC and it doesn't take a great deal of time or effort for those you know, those members to produce that document to be honest with you it's uh, I would consider it very simple to do to be honest. Um, okay so James you wanted to? No I was just going to say it's, um, you know, it varies doesn't it because um, you know, in certain, certain uh, sectors of the industry um, I think the statistics don't really sum up the true uh, scale of it. Um, you know, we look at the, 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 the worst side of it, which is the fatalities, but how many falls happen that, that people don't report back on. Mm -hmm. um, we live in an environment where, um, if I use the term, you know, whistleblower, you, you know, you don't want to be a whistleblower in this, in this industry, you know, you, you want to just get on with your job, you, your time management again, in terms of um, the duration of the, the work yeah. expected of you. 
but wouldn't the whistleblower, this is again down to culture, isn't it, within the organisation that you work for. So if a scaffolding company you know, has a no-blame culture, then the information will come back from site and you can produce documents to try and implement new safe systems of work. Yeah, and, and these, these, sorry, these, these no-blame cultures, they have to be driven from, you know, from a yeah. CEO, from a you know, board, all, all the way through the different chains of command. Because that's going to be one of the challenges, isn't it? It's around how you create this no-blame culture. And then you wanted to say something. Just thinking about better reporting, there are, there are a lot of very responsible bodies, trade associations, doing their own reporting. You've touched on it with NASC. I know Atlas does. We do our own reporting. I know lots of the AIF member trade associations do their own reporting. The information is there. The information is out there. And there are a lot of responsible contractors and responsible people who want to see that information and get hold of that data and do something with it. A central place where it could all be fed into and collated would not be a bad thing. Mm. Of all of the... Um of all of the input that went into the APPG, the way this consensus was in this one was to say that we should have better reporting of uh, incidents involving falls from hate. Because I believe Ridor yeah. at the moment, it does ask the, the distance of a fall, doesn't it? But then ask to give a, a brief description. But it's, and, and and the, it, that's, that's, that's where the problem comes. And it's very subjective then, that, correct, isn't it? And analysing that data is very correct. tricky. Yeah. I think, you know, really, you know, from everyone's point of view, any sensible, safety-minded organisation that wants to look at where, where do we direct our resources, where do we direct our efforts, the first thing you need to know and understand is what is the problem, how big is the problem, what is it we're dealing with. Th this would just get us to that situation. This would get us to the starting point of saying, right, okay, what is the problem, where is it, what do we need to be dealing with? and then we can start to look at, and I know the APPG mentions this as well, they can start to move on to, well, what about instead of waiting for the accident to happen, we actually ask for near misses, mm. we ask for the... Mm. Yeah, so we come on to that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yes. Find out what the precursor is to the accident, really. Yeah. Do you think that um, the fear of prosecution and loss of reputation is something that people will, you know, are wary to report near misses and things of that nature? I, I mean, I, I know that we've looked at it and the APPG, sorry. No, no, you know, it's, it's an APG, open <laughs> The APPG <laughs> took evidence from a number of voluntary reporting schemes. Eh? And uh, certainly when I've looked at it before, and, and uh, the vision that we have for it is that if you provide anonymity in there, right, if you're concerned, they don't see who you are. You don't need to tell us who you are. We are more concerned about gathering information, about gathering the data. Yes. And the only thing that we then need to guard against is that we have some means of ensuring that we don't have a, a duplicate reporting. Mm -hmm. And we can do that fairly easily with some fairly simple steps. Mm -hmm. But again, any reasonable, sensible, safety-minded organisation is already doing this stuff. Right. And it, it's that culture thing, isn't it? It's a, certainly at Delta, we're very much, if you have a near miss, please tell us. It is a free learning. It, you, yeah. Yes, it, it's, it's costly and it's time consuming and it's a bit of a pain to investigate a near miss, but not as much as investigating an accident. Absolutely. So let's do the near misses yeah. and let's sort those out and then we don't have to deal with the accidents. I agree and with you. I think there's, there's an important point to make in respect of industry or association led reporting systems. Um, those reporting systems can work very well where you have members who are at the sharp end. Mm. So where you have contractors and your organisation has a direct dialogue with them. It is in their interest and there are not too many st steps in between or too many um, intermediaries in between to get that information to you. It is difficult for some organisations such as PASMA and other organisations where the equipment that uh, falls within our remit gets to the user, the person at the sharp end, via maybe two, three intermediaries. And we're lucky if it even gets reported to the first one back. And it's certainly mm. difficult for it to get to the second one back. And it, it then never, never even gets to us. Mm. If we also look, look at it from the point of view of, I mean, I, I, I think the thing to bear in mind is, that the members of your organisations are the good guys. They're the guys who, who, are, who are already responsible and they're the people who are saying we should be part of an organisation, we want to you know, raise standards, we want to make sure that, that, that everything is as safe as possible. 
the difficulty is all of those outside your organisation who are undertaking the same activity but are not bound by your rules or any of the other good things that you guys do. And it comes down to, and I'm sure we will touch on it, on client education as well. So working at Height Regs and CDM, they say that they have, you should be choosing responsible contractors. And I, I believe the working at Height Regs mentions things like SSIP and, and trade associations looking for contractors who are, who are members of those bodies. So picking up what Peter said, that, that is a tick in the box. That's a yes. way that you can make sure you've got a responsible contractor who are doing the right things or, uh, and aspiring to, to improve. Well, let's talk about that now while we're up to the bonnet. So do you want to add any more or does, the, how the, do you want to come in? Quite often the client is, is um, monetary based on how they will place an order with a contractor regardless of, of, of what that subcontractor is dealing with. You know, and it's always this race to the bottom. You know, we, we can be cheaper, we can be cheaper. And I don't think you know, we've, we've got out of that over the years when there's a, a recession, everybody starts to keep cutting prices and it's not a case of whether we can do the job properly or whether we can do the job safely and on time. The client quite often thinks, well, they're a considerable amount cheaper so I'll place my order with them and hope that nothing happens and comes back to me. And we find that as an industry that, you know, this race to the bottom, we can do it cheaper, we can do it cheaper, is, is a common, you know, common occurrence every day to be honest with you. So not just responsible contractors, you need responsible clients exactly. as well. Exactly, yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, do, I do think as well that you, you, find that <laughs> you find that there is a level within industry where you have responsible clients, responsible contractors, who employ responsible subcontractors, and we have all the bits in place. And then there is this subculture underneath where you don't have responsible clients, you don't have responsible contractors, nobody's paying any particular attention to whether this uh, organisation or whether this subcontractor has any credentials that make them competent to undertake the activity. And it's this part at the bottom that is the most difficult bit for us to get to. Mm. And I know we'll come back to that again, I'm sure, at some yeah. point, because that is difficult to reach yeah. area. James, did you want to add anything at all? My, my stance on that would come um, from this, this, the, the, the key specification, uh, the, the driving uh, of the, the, the fit for purpose, if you like, the specification of the products and um, ancillaries that you put into, into these buildings. Um, you, know, you look at the, the, the hierarchy of risk and you always try and eliminate those risks, as, yep. as we've already discussed, and you do it all the way through that process. And really at the, at the top of that, that uh, pyramid should be the client. And, and the client, it goes back to that education. And if that client's not educated, um, and they're trying to build a, a building um, based on a certain monetary value, um, then they're, they're going to fall down. If they're, if they're not knowledgeable uh, in actually what they're going to get at the end of it, um, and you see, you, you see that in all walks of life, but uh, you know, in the construction side of things, you're, you're, you're building these buildings to, to last for the duration of how, they, how, how long they need to use them, um, but then you're also looking at that, uh, I want to say cradle to grave, but it's more cradle to cradle, so the refurb and Yes. Um, the, the ongoing use of these structures and buildings and um, so it's not just during construction it's um, well it's been occupied and it's also after that what, what's going to happen to these mm. these buildings and ma making important. sure that you emit those risks throughout the whole whole gestation of it. Th th this is a challenge <laughs> <laughs> and it's a challenge not just the client but from client and designer where certainly in, in my discussions with designers, architects, and, and you know, by extension for clients, I do not, I've not met anyone yet that takes the responsibility um, seriously to eliminate risk of fall. I, I don't see it. I see with designers and, and possibly with clients as well who are uh, you know, more intent on the aesthetics, it's, the building has to look nice, has to look lovely. Mm. And I'm not going to spoil it by putting a BMU at the top here because that's going to spoil the, the line of it. And, and so, you know, in the nicest possible way, what we see fairly regularly is with these you know, lovely buildings with big <coughs> atria is that they know they've got a responsibility for uh, ongoing maintenance and they've got to advise the client on that. And the answer is very simple, spider machine, uh, or rope access. Problem solved, I'm out here. And, and that, to me, is it's, it's, it's an opportunity missed because there, are, there is so much that could be done by designers yes. to eliminate the need to work at height 
this was a question I was going to come back to. I mean, we might as well sort of discuss it now. I mean, what are your sort of thoughts, Eleanor, about sort of the role of designers sort of designing out the risk from at the start? We, we work on a lot of structures where we see no, no, no kind of consideration about how access is going to be sought. And therefore, we are into temporary access. We're into, into those kind of measures. It is start, certainly in, in heavy industry, it's starting to happen more so. I can think of many chimneys where access is designed in, so permanent ladders, eye bolt fixings, all of, all of those things. So it is starting to come through, but it comes back to this education at the, the very basic, the start of it, which is important, and it is taking a while. Who, who can drive that education? Does it have to be sort of the, which body do you think should take responsibility for driving that education? Well, it should, it's there in legislation anyway. It, it should be considered. It isn't, but it, it should be or isn't considered as, as far as, as it should be. Um, it's a dialogue thing, though, isn't it? Education should come from the top. HSE should be driving that, that dialogue. Um, all of the trade bodies for, for architects and, and all of that, that should be being driven as well. Mm. The recent updates in CDM have definitely helped mm. in terms of putting the onus onto you know, principal contractors and clients and designers and and, uh, you know, and, and funneling out the, 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 the nitty gritty of it and actually giving the, um, the onus to a competent designer to actually impart um, an adequate scheme, an adequate yes. way of building the building, an adequate way of managing the building. And because it, I mean, I'm, I'm not an architect, I'm not a designer, that, that's not where, that's not my background, but I would have thought that to, to design in access would be so fundamental and such a sought after thing I thought that that would be ideal. That, if I were an architect, that would be what would be driving me to, mm -hmm. to design that mm -hmm. in. But amazingly, it's not. But yeah. amazingly, it's not. Because but it affects the aesthetics of the building. Yeah. <laughs> but and, and the, the bread and butter, the, the, the practicality, that would drive me. Oh. I'd, want to, I'd want to nail that. Yeah, that's a good point. And there are some architects who, as a you know, contractor, would work on projects and you can see things that are in place for future maintenance of the the project, uh, but on numerous occasions on projects that we're working on, there was no, you know, nothing in place for maintenance of that structure in the future. You know? you know, let, oh, let's be honest, though, um, the simple fact of the matter is that by not designing in or designing out the need to work at height, it's what keeps all these organisations in business, yep. okay? So we're, we're kind of, you know, we're kind of in a quandary. Uh, I, I think if we're doing what is morally and ethically right, we need to bring it to the attention of clients and designers to say, in actual fact, if you had designed this differently, if you'd put a gantry in there, if you'd got the lights to lower down so that we don't need to go up there, then that would have been a much better way of dealing yes. with it. Um, and, and although it does keep all of, you know, Scaffolding companies, MUPS companies, keeps them in business because they sell you know, big machines to, for, to get up to a tree and things like that. The simple fact of the matter is that if you look at it over, over a lifetime of a building, you are exposing people to risk of fall that many times that you need to go in and change the light bulbs. Whereas if you eliminated it, that, that's gone. Yeah, um, it's, a good, it's a good point. I was sort of going to come back to that later on when we talk about technology, because we did an article in um, Irish magazine around demolition, and they use um, drones to basically go and do um, observations up on chimneys. They still have to, at the end of the day, go up there to, on the chimney and do the work, but it just minimises the number of times they have to go up. So, I mean, is that, th that's a good point. It's around basically trying to sort of minimise the amount of work at height. We use drones. We certainly for heritage structures. So if we are, if we, we know that there's maintenance that's required on a heritage chimney, for example, we would use a, a drone to do a, a first shot at it, a first pass, see, see what we're looking at, um, check out the access, check out all of those things. And it can go back to the client and there's always a dialogue between us as the contractor and the client about planning. It can't eliminate everything, however. Sometimes you need to get your hands on it, sometimes. Mm. Certainly if you're doing um, any kind of, of non-destructive testing and, and you need to physically access the structure. Yeah. But it can give a very, very good first base to do better planning, to make sure that, that your access methodology is robust and it's fit for purpose. And you've eliminated as much risk as you can. Yeah. Alan, did you want to add anything? Not really, not on that side. <laughs> <laughs> no. 
we use drones as well. <laughs> Our office in Glasgow is a grade B listed building. Um, and because of the nature of what we do, we get very nervous about anyone undertaking work to the roof and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we'd asked our um, contractor uh, to have a look at the, the roof for us, and they'd done it the best they could. But it then became apparent that like, we actually cannot see it all. Mm -hmm. So we got a drone in, the drone went up over the roof, had a look at all of the slates up there, and as you see, we still had to go up to date, mm -hmm. but we knew we were going up to see. Mm -hmm. We knew where, where the repairs were to be done, and we knew that we could um, do a risk assessment and method statement based on there is a valley. We will not go outside of that valley, so there is no risk of fall. We're not going over the top of the ridge. Yeah. That's a really good point. Yeah. It allows you to plan correctly. That's it. Absolutely. For our, our works on refineries, certainly, so we, we've got a work at height element, but we also have a confined space element. So when these big outages happen and we're dropping down the inside of structures, we, we've got a, it's not a drone, but it's a, a special camera which can withstand very, very high temperatures. And we would access the inside of a structure whilst it is still online. Again, just reducing and eliminating as much risk as we can. We know what we're looking at before we even get in there. It's, yeah, it's fantastic technology when used in the right, right circumstance. So you've got, yes. It can't fix everything. No. Does anybody else want to come on to technology while we're on the subject? And um, James, is there anything you wanted to add around? One of the key initiatives in the last couple of years that MSA have uh, really tried to spearhead is, um, is the initiatives over virtual reality, augmented reality, actually enabling um, not just a salesperson to actually showcase a product uh, in a safe environment, but also educate as well. It keeps coming back to education. Uh, virtual reality is, um, is a great tool. We've uh, created a number of different um, strategies in there uh, across the different uh, sectors, you know, roofing, uh, aviation, um, uh, confined space, um, and it allows um, not just the, the, the operatives actually going out to do the work, it allows, um, it allows the decision makers, uh, the, the, if you like, the people you know, sat, in, sat in the offices, you know, not really understanding those, um, those risks, to actually uh, engage with that technology, um, you know, experience selecting the right, uh, the right protective equipment that they need, and actually gaining an understanding of, of why they need that, that equipment rather than just selecting an item from a catalogue um, and then actually experience it. Um, and I, I've got to say, virtual reality um, has come on leaps and bounds in the last few years and it's, uh, it's very realistic. I mean, um, our, our, one of our situations actually allows you to take a, a, a virtual fall. So you, can, you, can actually, you don't actually fall, but um, you, you can actually experience um, you know, falling a, a number of meters and then actually self-rescuing um, which then gives you a bit of a, a thought process around okay actually if i do fall you know what am i going to do now if i'm lone working um we need to get down we need to you know you need to get that first aid pretty quickly um so yes yeah, so virtual reality is great augmented reality is also a good tool probably more for uh, for sales you talked about management being able to sort of get involved in the you know, trying out the virtual reality yes. and we talked about the importance of the culture being driven from the top i mean i don't know if any of you use uh, virtual reality in training but do you feel that because it's sort of a novel technology that it is sort of interesting managers and getting there getting them more interested in looking at you know, working practices is that something that you found or we don't use virtual reality and um, we we are very much still if you're working at height, we're working at such high heights that we, we climb test all of our operatives. Virtual reality, reality is excellent, but there is still, it's still not the same as being very, very 150 metres mm. up in the air. Um, so we, we do do climb testing. I think virtual reality would be excellent, certainly in the working at height arena, for hazard perception. Because it comes, again, it comes back to the culture thing that we've talked about a lot, and it comes back to continual risk assessment. And if there would be, if, if you could have some kind of virtual reality program where an operative had to be taken through the steps of working at height, maybe accessing a working area mm. and being aware of the hazards around them, that would be, uh, it, in a very safe environment, that would be very, very useful, I think, because that, I believe, is one of the reasons that, that we have so many accidents and incidents that people just aren't aware, or they have very different, different perceptions of what a hazard is. I think it would then open up discussion mm, yes. in a in a training context in a group That's as to, to where the hazards were, how we'd respond to them. 
That's a good point. Well, th there is technology being developed at the moment for the scaffolding industry, um, for n new, new trainees uh, to get a feel for what it's like to be working at height and uh, the perception of those hazards. You know, what, what is a risk? You know, how do they uh, uh, change their complacency of being on a, a scaffold with double handrails and a fully boarded platform to actually working over you know, uh, water, for instance, that will give you an, an idea of what you have to look at when you're working above water or high, high rise buildings. Uh, yeah, so that will be useful to, to trainees. Not so sure about whether experienced scaffolders would, would find that to be a benefit or not. You know, you'd like to think that they've had their training and their experience and they're competent to carry out the works. But anything unusual and new could be used to, you know, to do a, a run through prior to actually going out onto site and, and building that particular structure. But what it what it does allow you to do is update the the, the software to, for for new for new technology, something that's uh, been brought in, and it allows you to roll that out to um, to, to other platforms, you know, app ba app based platforms, where you can actually share it with, with with people on the ground, just as a refresher, if you like, at the very least. But it's never going to omit um, the, the need for specific training yes. and dedicated training. But, uh, but you do get people who've been in the industry who've worked at height all their life and then it's just that one small moment when they, they, they don't clip on, for example, and they can, I mean, it, these, you do hear about these instances. So, I mean, do you think that technology can help people who have been in the industry for a long time, who've had the training? So we, we first of all have um, looked at and have developed uh, gamification, so basically taking a tower build and doing it virtually. So you actually take the components and you put them together. Some of them are guided, so you know if you're an absolute novice, it will you know take the component and it, and it will put it into place. Some of them are not guided, so you need to do it yourself. And then there are others which are based on uh, scenarios. So basically, you have some choices to make, but a bit like those kind of games that, that, that they used to play, depending on the route that you take, will result in things happening. Um, and I think one of the ones that you covered as well, James, was uh, looking at how do we can we simulate a fall? Right? So can we simulate you've actually got it horribly wrong, and the whole lot's going to come crashing down? So w w we're working on developing some of that. And uh, I mean, uh, although it, it's difficult to try and simulate what a real fall is like, I can tell you it feels quite real at the time. It is really quite disconcerting when it happens. Um, we know that some of our colleagues in IPATH and the Power Access side are, are pretty far advanced, although they're also looking at it the same way as we are. The difficulty is in, in rolling this technology on a wider basis. So we have 350 training centres. You're talking about some expensive kit to, to, to be able to roll this out. Um, I have seen it used very effectively as a pre-qualification for, for instance, some of the, some of the um, so sort of people that might be working in, 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 in your industry. Uh, and that was in South Africa. They've got this virtual reality to try out, which is for novices coming into the industry. This organisation works at really, really high heights, 100 metres plus, and they use this pre-qualification. How do you react at this kind of height <laughs> looking down there? And I personally would not have thought that that would have been very useful, but looking at it, it really is quite useful. In, basically sorting out those who are going to freeze when they get to a high height. Mm. Um, the other main thing, the other main advantage I see in it, and, and really uh, we've yet to explore this to, to, its, to its full, we frequently want to demonstrate to, to users of equipment what can happen when you don't do it right, what can happen when it goes wrong. It's very, very difficult to simulate that in reality, right, in real life because yeah. you, there is real risk. Mm -hmm. The big opportunity in virtual reality is you can do all of that stuff. You know, really, really serious stuff going wrong, serious stuff not being you know, assembled properly, and you can show what will happen as a result of that. Mm -hmm. that, that, I think, is the, is the big opportunity. Mm -hmm. Still, I think th that we've got some way to go in terms of the cost involved, in terms of the yeah. cost to roll it out. But I think it can add quite significantly to, 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 to the normal instructor-led delivery. And it's in a safe environment, of course, yeah. which is 
absolutely ideal. They use it a lot in aviation to, to great effect. You think of all the simulated hours that, that pilots have to go through. It obviously does work. Yeah, it's a good point that you made there about the cost of it though, because we know that a lot of the, um, it's the hard to reach sort of groups in, in the industry um, where a lot of these fatalities and injuries are taking place. I mean, what sort of, um, if we are going to use technology not as a solution but as a contributor to improving safety for small businesses, what do you see any sort of technologies that could help? It, whatever happens, it's got to be grassroots. The CITB has got a big drive about getting young people into construction. And this is going to take a long time. Technology is still advancing. It's, it's obviously going to take a long time. But it's got to be grassroots. Kids today, they, they're so switched on to technology, that would be the kind of thing that, that would switch them on. They, they would respond very well to those kind mm -hmm. of training avenues. That's where one, one where, place where it should be happening. It should be happening in the training centres, in the colleges, at, at apprentice days, for all the apprentices, that they should have, be having access to that. I, I think there, there is one area in particular that I know we are working on and, and I think this presents really a, a, you know, possibly a game-changing um, opportunity and that is um, developing mobile apps that are in the hands of the people who are at the sharp end. And really the opportunities are boundless, the sort of things that we can do with mobile apps to get information directly to the people that you need to get it to in their hands, right there, when they're, you know, when they're, when they're doing what they're doing. And, and, you know, we've yet to, I think, even scratch the surface of, of the power of that. Um, some of the stuff that, we, that, for instance, we are looking at is um, using the mobile app to provide a means of uh, recording inspections. And, I mean, the technology's there. It's just a matter of joining those bits together. So record the inspection, geoposition it, Time stamp it, date stamp it, allocate it to the person who's, who's, who's put it together, and then moving it forward, even artificial intelligence will in time be able to say, actually, there are no two guardrails there, so you're getting a message back straight away, you need to get that, that sorted. There are, as I said, I just think that that is a very, very powerful direction for us to go in. And, and of course, when I say that, it then takes you automatically down the route of, um, we as organisations spend a lot of time training and providing technical knowledge to people who use the equipment, the work at equipment that, that our members provide. As you will be aware, competence is generally determined as being a combination of training, technical knowledge and experience. The experience is the bit that gets us every time. It gets most organisations. We've seen a few organisations come up with C, uh, sort of what you call it, log books. Um, I'm not taking anything away from them, it's, it's something. I personally don't think it's very effective. If you could have something like this, where you have a mobile app, this is all my own work, that's what I've been doing this week, that then can be added to your CPD and you essentially are making it easy for people to demonstrate experience and for us to implement continual professional development at the very basic level of anybody that's involved in work at it. It's yeah. actually culture rolling, Absolutely. doesn't it? Because Correct. it's getting buy-in from each individual operative in their career, in, in their working progression. Yeah. And, and I think that is important. And as soon as they've got buy-in in their career progression, they've got buy-in in safety. I think that th they go hand in hand. I was listening to something just the other day, actually, on radio, and it was about Tesco Club Card. I don't know if you know, but Tesco Club Card. They're giving up on the club card, they're moving on to the next one, again, according to the... I don't know if he was a futurologist, but something of that nature. The next thing, as far as you're concerned, was you go past the card. The card done its job. It let us know who you are, where you are, what you're buying, and we can now target directly to you. I see this as being the same thing. We know who you are. We know what you've been trained to do. We can see that you're putting your training to good use. So the payback for you is when it comes to renewing your card, you don't need to train again because you've demonstrated that you have the experience, that you're competent, and if you don't demonstrate that, then you'll have to do the training again, and that's, that's the disadvantage of yeah. no keeping up to date with it, yeah? James, did you want to? No, uh, um, I, I second that. In, in, our, um, in our training culture, we, we adopt that, that uh, mentality um, in the sense of, you know, it's, it's useless giving a week's training every year. Uh, if you can show that you've engaged and you've used that skill um, on site, and you can, you can showcase that in, in your work, and in the reporting, then you, you can basically just keep that refreshing training at, at a minimum, which then 
minimizes the cost, minimizes the exposure, yes. um, keeps that, that understanding going, um, and imparts that knowledge. And then they can, sh they can, use, they can impart that to, to their, their colleagues. And good training is excellent. We, I mean, at Delta, we, we train, we spend thousands of pounds and lots of man hours training, and you talk to, to the operatives, and I know what training they enjoy, and I know what training they don't enjoy, and I also know that bad training, training that they just have to do to tick a box to renew their cards, mm. switches them off training. You don't want operatives switched off training. You want, tr you want operatives who want to learn. You want operatives yes. who, who want to be engaged when they sit in a training centre. So we, we tr obviously there's training that's mandatory that we have to do, and they have to do every one, three, five years, depending on what the training is. But then we also try and give them the very exciting, informative um, courses that, that are going to help them, that are going to help them progress. And they come back buzzing. They, they have enjoyed it. They've learned something. They, they've learned something that they can apply to the world of work. And that's fantastic because, again, it's the culture thing. It switches them on. Yeah. Well, the scaffolding industry introduced a CPD uh, program uh, around two years ago. And uh, it was a lot of people were up in arms that they would have to go and, and you know, you're already qualified scaffolder, but now I'm going to have to go back to the classroom. And it's a two day course, and basically it goes through changes in legislation since the last time you were qualified. And most of the responses, you know, the, uh, up into the 80 90% of people's responses, I've actually learned something from that. And it's, and it's, you know, it's a worthwhile exercise. And I think those people that were against it in the, at the beginning have now changed their minds. So I think everyone agrees that CPD is, is the way forward for, for our industry. Yeah.